Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. Roger, turn around, I started. Roger, capsule turning around, and I could see the booster during turnaround just a couple of hundred yards behind me. It was beautiful. Roger, seven, you have a go at least seven orbits. Roger, understand go for at least seven. This episode is being filmed on February 20th, 2022, making it the 60th anniversary of the history-making flight of astronaut John Glenn aboard Friendship 7. In today's episode, I'll share a myriad of artifacts highlighting that flight in order to offer up some perspective on just how big of a deal this flight was back in 1962. It's a story steeped in Cold War era drama, and it served as the literal tipping point for the United States and its space program. Further, its backstory goes a long way in explaining why John Glenn became the worldwide hero and inspiration that he did. As you'll see, the sheer number of artifacts in this story will tip you off and demonstrate just how significant this one space flight was and why it remains an inspiration to this day, 60 years on. Are you ready to dive in? Well, away we go. Hello collectors and space fans, I'm Jim Frangione and welcome to the 20th installment of Taking Up Space. And befitting of that milestone will mark one of the greatest days in U.S. space history, February 20th, 1962. As we explain in every episode, this is the place where space history lives and where every artifact tells a story. Where we seek to preserve vintage artifacts, reveal their history, and in doing so, hopefully inspire some of you in the next generation of space explorers to take on pursuits relating to science, technology, engineering, art, and math. If you're as passionate as I am about spaceflight or the preservation of space age history, be sure to click on the subscribe button and notification bell down below so that you don't miss out on a single episode. There's no getting around it. For me, John Glenn and the story of his Friendship 7 spaceflight, well, it's the OG. I can remember being a second grade student in the mid-1970s when I first became aware of these events, care of a film strip presentation given in class. Remember those? Film strips, long rolls of film containing still photos, and their cassette tape audio tracks and the loud beep that would signal the teacher or the student to advance the frame on the projector. If you grew up back then, you definitely remember these, along with things like overhead projectors and mimeograph machines. Anyway, in my earliest childhood recollections, I always had some kernel of interest in space dating back to the latter days of the Apollo program. With older siblings in the house in that era, space just seemed to be, I don't know, present in my life from early on. But it was that film strip that lit the fire of imagination for me. Suddenly there was a name and a face that my seven-year-old self could attach to the idea of space travel. It was the big bang moment for what would become a lifelong fascination with rockets, space flight, exploration, and the astronauts. And it's something that inspires me to this very day. So, with the hope that some of that awe and wonder might rub off on the younger members of the viewing audience, my sharing of this story and the accompanying artifacts here will hopefully light the fire in your imagination. After all, we're at the beginning of a great renaissance in human space exploration, and it will be your generation that will see opportunities in science, technology, engineering, art, and math unlike any generation before you. For the older folks checking this out, it might be a trip down memory lane, but in either case, I hope to add some context that might help explain why all of this stuff speaks to us as a sign of the times in February of 1962. 60 years on, it's kind of hard to comprehend just how heroic all of this was back then. What we take for granted in our knowledge of space flight today was entirely unknown back in 1962, both from the standpoint of the machines and their human occupants. I suppose this stands to reason when you consider that since the beginning of operations aboard the International Space Station, there have been human beings living and working in space every single day for more than 20 years, a full third of that time since John Glenn's flight aboard Friendship 7. 1962, it was an entirely different enterprise. Back then, if you were successful, you were conferred hero status. There were massive ticker tape parades and you were touring the world promoting goodwill and, less than subtly, the benefits of democracy itself. And that's where this story takes a very interesting turn. You see, in 1962, all of this was uncharted territory in terms of science, technology, and national capability. And the only folks who had done it before, well, they were our sworn enemies, the Soviet Union. They had been beating the United States to the punch with every first in space since 1957's launch of the world's first satellite, Sputnik. 
They did it again when they orbited Yuri Gagarin just weeks before we could manage the suborbital flight of Alan Shepard on Freedom 7. In August of 1961, the Russians succeeded yet again when they orbited German Titov for over a full day in space, a mind-boggling advance at the time. Making matters worse, American diplomacy abroad was taking a beating in crisis after crisis, starting with the failed invasion of the Bay of Pigs in Cuba, then came what many saw as President Kennedy's drubbing at the hands of Nikita Khrushchev during the Vienna summit, then the crisis in Berlin, which ultimately divided the city by a wall for the next quarter century, and as if you needed to place an exclamation point on the end of 1961, the Soviet Union conducted the largest nuclear test ever in October. In short, less than 20 years after the U.S. led the Allies to victory against fascism in World War II, democracy and American prestige looked to be lagging. The United States needed a win. Badly. And all of this sets the stage for the flight of Friendship 7, targeted for January of 1962, in full view of the world. After several delays for either technical reasons or poor weather, we arrive at February 20th, 1962, and the sense of tension, worry, and urgency is palpable. Everything seems to be on the line. Mission success, John Glenn's life, NASA and the nation's space program, and, not least of which, confidence in America the world over. When it launches, the world is on the edge of its collective seat. I've always thought that this one photo from inside New York City's Grand Central Terminal, captured at best with its bustling halls brought to a screeching halt, everyone looking at the launch on a monitor. The photo itself seems to be holding its breath. As we well know, the mission was a smashing success, even though it lasted only three of its intended seven orbits. As if any more life and death drama needed to be added to this story, an errant signal from a sensor aboard Friendship 7 indicated that Friendship 7's landing bag had deployed while in orbit. If correct, John Glenn would have perished during re-entry. As we know, that was not the case. On the contrary, the nation and the free world lost its collective mind for John Glenn and everything that he and the successful mission of Friendship 7 represented. America, it seemed, was more than capable of competing, and she wasn't looking back. We see that in all of these artifacts, a plethora of things adorning his likeness and heralding the success of Friendship 7. The sheer volume of things here signals the significance of the day's events. Magazines, trading cards, buttons, records, home movies, postage stamps, model kits, ad campaigns, you name it. And of course, parades befitting a king. These things, the iconography of 1962, tell the story. John Glenn looms large in our collective American psyche today because he and his flight aboard Friendship 7 were tantamount to a space-age David slaying the Soviet Goliath in the heavens. So there you have it, folks. With everything on the line, John Glenn came through in a very big way. I hope that these colorful artifacts help to reveal a little bit of that story for you, because everything about him was so extraordinary. With his lifelong love Annie by his side, John Glenn would go on to have a long and rich career as a senator from Ohio. And he would return to space in 1998 aboard Discovery for the STS-95 mission, where he set a record that still stands today for the oldest human being to ever orbit the Earth. From that mission, my collection includes this signed cover of Time magazine. The cover's tagline, a timely reminder that we can still have heroes, is as important today as it was in 1998 or in 1962 for that matter. It's right that John Glenn should be remembered on this day for what he did and for how he still inspires greatness for the future generations. We need John Glenn now more than ever. If you want to learn more, check out John Glenn's memoir, the documentary film John Glenn, an American Hero, or the absolutely phenomenal book by Jeff Scheschel titled Mercury Rising. It's definitely one of the best books I've read on the topic. In evoking the tensions of 1962, you won't be able to put this book down, I promise. As a public service to all of you, I've listed links to all three of these resources in the description down below. And that's a wrap for today, my friends and fellow space enthusiasts. Thanks a million for tuning in today. If you've enjoyed this installment, please give it a thumbs up down below and feel free to let me know your thoughts by dropping me an email at jim.takingupspace at gmail.com. Until next time, collectors and space fans, keep your heads held high and keep your eyes on the stars.